Give it up for Mary. Amen. So good. Amen? Amen. I just want to look at my people. Okay, so uh, my name is Mary. Some of you are new here, so you weren't here last year. So on the count of three, if you all could say your name together, because I want to bring you into my heart, that'd be great. One, two, three, you are? Okay, now we're like besties. Awesome. I'm so excited to be here. Um, you know those places that you, now I, I travel for a living. I do um, full-time ministry, some life coaching. Um, I'm a follower of Jesus. I live in New Orleans, uh, which I love, but I'm from, the nor- I'm from Indiana, so I understand the cold. Come on, Indiana peep. And um, so it's, but I love coming up here because it's like a remind, it's like a reminder of home. It's a reminder of my people. I'm excited to kind of go deeper. And I do a lot of traveling uh, in my job and what I do. And so I get a lot of crazy things that happen at the airport. And just recently, when I was traveling, just last week, um, I, I showed up. You ever have those moments where you're packed? We've been talking about, like, the promises, right? We've been talking about the journeys that we have. And I don't know if you're in school or I don't know what your story is. But I was traveling out to a speaking event, and I had all these things planned. Anyone here a planner? All right, you all know what I'm talking about. You have the plan. You have the agenda. You have the suitcase packed, perfectly zipped up. Come on. I am ready for my mission. I'm ready to go out. And everything was like aligned. I checked my flight. And as I rolled up to the airport, um, I noticed that there were like newscasters all around. And I was like, you know, I'm like, what's going on? So I kind of scope in. I walked into the New Orleans airport and there was no one there. And so I start panicking. I'm like, okay, so I run up, and I'm, I'm kind of maneuvering between the people. And you know how everyone's like friends when we're all in a panic? Like, all of a sudden, it's like, you're my bestie now. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I don't know. Everything's gone. And so in the midst of this, this circus, um, my flight was canceled. All the flights were canceled, and there was nowhere to go. And I had this panic. Um, now I know you guys are all like holy people. that You're like, I'm just going to figure it out, <laughs> right? I was like a little panicked, and I had this anxiety that hit, and I didn't know what to do, and so I called my people, and I'm like, what about the people I'm going to speak to? What about this? And I start going into fix-it mode. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You're like, buckle in. We're going to do this. And so I'm like, call my friend. Do this, this, da-da-da-da. Panic. I just got to fix it. And then all of a sudden, like everything I tried, closed door, closed door, closed door, to a point where I'm like, there's nowhere I'm going to go. And I had this moment in the airport. It's completely deserted, Right? Where I'm sitting there, I literally sat on the floor of the airport. <laughs> this floor. This, this is last week. This is not like a story. This is like Mary. I'm like, <laughs> Jesus, right? And when I start today, at that posture, you can't see me in the back of sitting on the floor of that place that we're stuck with a journey ahead of us. I want that to be an icon that we walk into. And I say that because you're like, well, Mary, we've been talking about the promises of God. We've been talking about the destination, the promised land, the holy of holies, from mountain to mountain, from glory to glory. You want to talk about the glory. I want to talk about the glory. But the reality in the midst of our lives is sometimes we have our suitcases packed and we have dreams in front of our eyes and we have the boyfriend and the husband and we have the kids and we have the job and we have the dreams and the heart and the anticipation and the reality is that we can walk up to that airport door we can kind of go up to that step and suddenly it seems like everything is canceled like we've just had two years come on Anyone the last two years of COVID, of the craziness of watching a whole world in a panic, trying to fix, trying to uh, adjust, trying to mold their way when they can't control the fact that the flights are not moving, the masks are not coming off, people are not getting healed. Where is our God? And in the midst of that all, we stand there on the floor, right? Sitting on the floor, maybe our rooms at our college. Come on, guys. We've all had a moment in the last two years. We say, where are you? I don't see you here. I don't see you in the midst. And I love preaching about the glory because we're going to talk about the glory, but I want to talk about the movement of God in that valley. The movement of God of what we see between the the, the mountains to mountains. There's a valley. We did a a podcast this morning. You should all listen to it. And I was being, I mean, I was like, this morning the Lord was ministering to my heart about the in-between about how do we get from glory to glory. Sometimes there's a valley in between and to have the faithfulness to know that he's with us. There's a promise in this beautiful story of Joshua, which I'm going to get so excited to break open to you. There's a number of promises actually throughout all of scripture. And there's this moment in Joshua. So um, through a number of years, I was like obsessed with Ephesians. Ephesians was my scripture. 
Come on, Ephesians. But Joshua has been my new one. So I'm so excited prophetically how God um, has been moving. And so in 2019, just a little bit about me, um, I felt like before the COVID hit that God, it was a Joshua season. And I felt like the Lord um, was moving us into the new promised land. And I had all these prophetic words. And, I was, and then right after that COVID hit. And uh, <laughs> like, thank you, Jesus. But I think there's a lesson in that because he's preparing us. He's preparing a way. He's preparing our hearts if we have eyes to see. He's preparing us for something. So in this story of Joshua, when he starts telling about the promises as he goes into there, he says this line. I want us to zone in on it. He says this one simple line. Have not I commanded you to be strong and of good courage? Be not frightened, neither be dismayed. For I am the Lord God who is with you wherever you go. And he says back in in, um, in 5, he says, For I was with Moses, and I will not fail you or forsake you. Like, no matter, your, no matter that if you're on the airport floor, no matter where your journey is, no matter what you see, I'm not going to leave you. I'm the God Yahweh, Emmanuel, God with us. I mean, this is Advent. This is the season where we talk about that God comes into the darkness. God, a God that we don't see always in the midst of our, of our lifestyle, comes in the midst of a manger and actually comes with us. A God, Emmanuel, a God with us. And throughout Scripture, this is his promise. We talked about this last night, right? The promise after promise after promise. In the midst of that, what I want to evoke today, what I want to just stir your hearts, is a people who will actually turn their faces to a God who's speaking it today. A God that even though we cannot always see in the darkness, there is a light that is greater than the darkness that is being proclaimed, and we have to be the people in this season. I'm going to get passionate. I might spit on the front row up here because I think God is doing something, and, and it means it doesn't look like what we think it looks like. It doesn't always look all pretty in a little box. Sometimes it's in a major, in the manure, and God uplifts the holy of holies. And if we could be a people to do that, but it, it calls us to do something. I love, how, I love yesterday because Dan, like, set me up. I was like, this is going to be amazing. Like, I love you, Dan. Like, because he's, he's talking about the promises. He's talking about remembering, right, to remember. And today my talk really is we talk about, well, what do we have to do? You're talking about this promise today. What are you going to talk about today? I'm actually going to be talking about turning to that promise. And what, is, what do you mean turning? We're already Christians, Mary. <laughs> We're already turned to him, right? I mean, the reality, though, is that there are parts of my heart, and I'm just going to be vulnerable as we begin today, that this season God has shown me my own heart. The greatest gift of COVID has been not about uh, the slavery in the world. It hasn't been about the, the, the issues out there. It's been highlighting the places that I don't believe, the places that I don't see him, the places, like, we're all great when God, when, you know, we got the, everything together, everything looks great. I love Jesus when I'm looking good and things are going well. Jesus is my Lord and Savior, amen and yes, right? Like, come on. Things get a little tight. You sque- and the analogy I like to always say, if you squeeze an orange, orange juice should come out, right? You squeeze an apple, apple juice should come out. If you squeeze a Christian, Christ should come out. And hear me right now, people, we have a culture where Christians are being squeezed and everything but Jesus is coming out. Everything in my own heart, God is showing me in the squeezing, in the pressing of the oil. Come on now. In the wine presses, I want to talk to you about a new revelation that Joshua comes in. Not in the old covenant, a new covenant. And there's a crushing. And there's a breaking. And there's a turning. And in that turning, we actually become new people. It's the promise of Jesus. That that I, I want to just talk to you about, what do I mean? Okay, what do you mean by repentance? Repentance is a big word we use often. We've heard it in the... In the Gospels, a repentance is a turning, right? The Greek word for that is metanoia, right? Meaning a turning of our thoughts and our beliefs. To turn our thoughts, our emotions, our heart, everything in our soul realm, heart, mind, emotions, to the face of Jesus, to live for him in every part that we are. And so some of you are like, well, that's, I live for him. I think, I mean, why does, what do we say the word turn? Why can't it just be like a hop to Jesus, (laughs) Why can't it be just like, okay, go higher to Jesus? Why is it this turning? I snowboard. I want to be a snowboard chick because they're freaking bad out, uh, bad out people, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Like, I want to be, but they teach you in snowboarding that where you look, like if you go down, I'm a right, I lead with my right. They teach you that where you look, where you look is where you go. Where you face is where you go. Where your body turns to is the direction where your eyes see, right? The vision where you're going to is the direction that your body will follow. And so he's saying, turn, we can't just turn a little arm or an elbow, we have to turn the whole way. 
We have to turn that our whole body, everything that we are, is faced to the king on him, on who he is. Because when we start looking, like just on that snowboard, if I just turn this way or that way, I'm going to go in a lot of different directions. And we have a whole culture of people right now screaming in a lot of different directions. And Jesus is saying, turn, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The glory that came 2,000 years ago is today. And if a people would turn their ways to me, I would show them the way of freedom. I would show them the way of a new life in the gospel. And I grew up Catholic my whole life. Can we have a moment? Like, I kind of got duped with the gospel. Do you ever feel like that? You're like, I mean, not duped, but I, I, I learned it, but I thought I was about going through the rules. I thought I was about just, like, checking the box. Jesus is going to follow the rules, going to get to heaven. It was about the, you know, I, one day I want to get to heaven, but I, I didn't know it was about heaven getting into me. It was about a new creation in my soul. It was about looking like Jesus and talking like Jesus and becoming more like Jesus. And so when we talk about the story of Joshua there's a, I'm going to do a little theology on you. And there's a terminology that we use at, in, in studies called typology. Typology is a type of an Old Testament imagery, analogy, that points to the fulfillment in the New Testament. So we see this in a number of ways, right? We see this in the Old Testament where um, Eve, right, her disobedience leads to destruction. Mary is the new Eve, Right? Um, we see this idea with the, 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 even Noah and, and the ark as a, as a symbolism of baptism. Everything in the Old Testament starts pointing to the new. And the story of Israel is our story. It's a typology. It's an imagery. The new Moses, right, is Jesus is the new Moses. Jesus is the new Joshua, which Joshua in Greek means Jesus. You know that? So in the, what's happening when this whole idea, Dan talked about, I want to slow down. I want to slow down and say, what's happening in the story when they're saying, yes, we walk out? So when Israel is in the wilderness, right, they've been freed. So Christ has, in the, symbol, in the symbolism of what happened, Christ comes to free us from sin. But the first part of that story, they're in the desert for a long time, 40 years. They're wandering, and they're bitter, and they're angry. What's about my manna? They're complaining. And why doesn't the gospel just end there? Because they're free. It's because they're not living in freedom. Hear me. This is what I want you to get to. This is really important that we understand what, the, what is the meaning of the gospel. The meaning of the gospel, right, isn't just about me one day getting into heaven. It's about me conforming my life to look like Jesus. It's about the Holy Spirit, right, because when they're still in the desert land, they're not looking, they're, they're not free. Egypt is still in their hearts. Slavery lives within their hearts. Slavery is in their hearts, even though they're free, so we can be baptized. So I have a friend of mine. Let me, let me give you another example. I want to just you to get this. It says in Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ came to set us free. Kind of crazy. It is for freedom that Christ, that's a lot of Fs, right? Freedom, right. So I have a friend of mine who um, once was, uh, who was, uh, in, worked in a, um, what's the word? Um, a factory. I couldn't find the word. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I worked at a factory, late hours, and one night he was like in the factory and he got stuck in the elevator. And he tells me this story. And I don't know if any of you are claustrophobic, like, right? That would be like my horror story, right? So he's stuck in the elevator, middle of the night, everything's going wrong, and he has this panic. He can't breathe. His cell phone is not with him. He can't get a hold of his wife. And there's this moment. He tells a story, and I remember sitting there like, that's incredible. And he tells a story about when the doors first opened. And he stepped out to, to breathe. He stepped out to freedom. He stepped out to a new life. He stepped out to a new reality that was different than being stuck and conformed. And I often think about what would happen if the doors were open. So Christ, by his death, has, has opened the doors of salvation. By our baptism, we are saved. The doors are opened. But what happens if we ever walk out that door? What happens if we're, the doors are There are people that might even get to heaven. Right? I'm not talking about salvation. I'm talking about living freedom. Dan talked about this. I want you to taste this because oftentimes we don't understand the gospel actually wants to make us free. Free from me. Free from my anxiety and my fears and all the things I used to live by. My conversion happened when I was 19 years old. I believe that God is going to awaken right here, many of you, to a new calling, a new way of walking in freedom. And it says in, in this Joshua story, and I, I want us to get kind of gritty on this, because Joshua's story is our story, but what happens is there's a generation that lives in the wilderness. There's a generation that doesn't get to seek freedom. And I know with my parents, who walked in the charismatic renewal, and I know you have wonderful parents, and we have many people in the church, 
way generations above us that maybe have like been free. They're in heaven. They're going to be saved. But in the story of Joshua, there's a new generation. I don't know if you know this. That the new generation, the young generation, the old generation passes away. And he upraises a new generation who will go into the promised land. And please hear the prophetic voice right now because this is really important. That we are in a season right now with COVID. There's something happening on a spiritual realm that's bigger than us. I don't know if you see the world shaking. I want you to hear this from a prophetic voice that God is raising up a new generation. Right now, right now, there is a rumbling happening. Things are moving in the spiritual realm. And if you're here and you're like, everything's going crazy, it's because something glory, the glory of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. And right now, the generations before us, maybe our parents or our grandparents that haven't tasted and seen the glory, God's giving an invitation of a new door opening and the glory of heaven coming into a new people who will walk and pass the Jordan, who won't live in the slavery of sin, who won't, come, who won't fall into all. And we're going to talk about sin because we're going to talk about repentance. I'm not here saying that we all got it together. I'm saying we've got to be a people on our knees. To say, God, make me, make me new. This year, God's wrecked me. I mean, wrecked me in the most beautiful way. I mean, like a wrecking ball like Miley Cyrus, right? Like, coming in, ninja chopping my heart. I'm on my room sobbing at night. I don't know everything that's going on. Looking at, because like in the beginning, like I had my conversion in college. I found Jesus, 19 years old. Just my story. We're all going to just cuddle together, right? I just feel like I'm like, come on. I feel like I'm rallying my troops, and I feel like when I, was in, when I was in college, I was like, I partied, I struggled with anxiety and depression. And on the outside, it looked like I had it all together. Right? We have a lot of functioning, depressed people in this room. We got a lot of functioning, depressed people in the world. And I'm not saying that as a criticism. I'm saying that there's a new hope and a new glory as we, as we cross the desert into the wilderness. But it's going to cost us something. There's going to be a cost at that. And I want to say that because I, don't, I, I spoke to young people in my early part of my ministry, and I just talked about the love of Jesus because I do believe that. God, it, please hear me that I cry out every night because he's set me free from me. He set me free from me. And I just was crying with my girlfriends. I have two friends here, Monica and Sarah. We were in the room just today crying over my own brokenness, crying. I am on the journey to him, and I want him to have it all. And as I walk in that, sometimes it's a messy, imperfect thing, just like the manger. But he's still at work, and I still see the rumble. I still see the power of God move. And it's a glorious story. But I want to just evoke your hearts to say, it's time. It's time, because this story, right, the enemy's in all of our ears. What I'm seeing in the culture today is a church that doesn't know who they are, that doesn't know whose they are. And it's my own story. I don't say that as like, look at the church. I'm saying, look at my heart. Look at the parts of my heart that aren't conformed to him. What I mean by that is we have areas in all of our hearts. Just like Joseph, they had a territory that was occupied by someone else. They had a territory occupied by the Hittites, the Philistines, Right? The, the Ammonites, the Depressionites, the Anxietyites, the Parentsites, the Pastites, the, the Addictionites, whatever it is in your sin in your life, they had territories in their heart, in their land that were taken over by giants. And God said, I've given you the land, meaning my heart, your heart is made for me. I made a covenant in you from the beginning of time. Everything in you must proclaim and be a light to the nations. But they're all standing there and saying, what the heck? But there's giants in there. And he's saying, take courage. I'm with you. And in that reality, right, as I promise you, the go I'm giving you the gospel today. Sometimes we don't realize that the gospel also comes with a cost. To say, well, we face those giants. We, Dan talked about it. I just want to go a little bit into the heart. I want to go into the heart of what you believe. When we talk about the renewal of our mind, when we talk about metanoia, the turning, it's a, tr it's a change of our beliefs. When I say turning our minds, this is why it says in, in Romans 12, be transformed. The Greek word for transformed is meta, metamorpho. It's the same word as metamorphosis, like a butterfly. Be transformed it means not just a little turn, not just become a little nicer person to your parents. It means become new, like Jesus. Become who you were created to be. You weren't made for sin, you weren't made for addiction, you weren't made for gossip. You are made for, for all the stuff that we settle for. Know who you are. Rise, my children. There is a light and a way to walk in freedom. And some of us don't believe it. It's not I say that because in my own heart, there's areas where the giants seem bigger than his promise. 
There's areas in my heart, and I want us to look at our hearts today. I'm not going to give anything today besides just turning a flashlight on your heart, not in condemnation, not in anger, but to say there's a God who's calling you to rise. Like, like Isaiah 61, rise for the glory of the Lord is upon you. And there's a generation where the glory of God is saying, rise, come into your destiny and lay down your life. And it's brutal and it's hard. But if we have courage, take courage, we will see the glory in this generation. And so what I want to ask you, even as I get, this is just the intro. <laughs> just warm it up. Sorry. I just get in the heart ticker ready. Is, is what do you believe? As you look at your life right now, I want to take a moment because I don't want to just give you time. I want you to, I want you to just think for a moment. As you look at your heart, your te- if your heart were the territory that God wanted to completely consume, it says love me. The, the, the call of God is to love God with all your mind, heart, and soul. Strength, everything in you, your territory, yourself, worshiping the king. This is the gospel, to look like him, to walk in him, to resemble him, where he and I are so intimately connected by the spirit that you can't tell where, tell where Christ begins and I end. That's the good news, to be conformed to him in every single way. That's, a, that's Sometimes I'm like, dang, I can't even like, have patience at Starbucks, and you want me to be like, you want me to do that, but to, to have that, and there are areas in our heart, and I want you to look at your heart for a moment as we begin today. I want you to think about the areas of your heart that maybe you haven't laid your life down to him that you haven't given him and I mean that like for me in my life I've really struggled and sometimes our sin is big sin like I've struggled with addiction in my life I've struggled with anxiety and I don't mean anxiety or depression is a sin it is not a sin it's real I've struggled with it but areas where I haven't believed I have unbelief in my heart bitterness in my heart resentment unforgiveness people that from high school do you remember high school do you remember do you remember grade school like I still, you know, like those things that resound in the woundedness of those territories. Because what happens in our life, as I do inner healing work, right, is when the enemy comes in, when we get wounded, the enemy can come as a liar and a giant and take territory in a part of our heart where we're not free. And so some of you might have areas that you are free, that you're walking, you love him. But when, when trouble comes, when pressure comes, right, those giant's voices sound louder than the promises And God's saying, it's time to rise up and take down the giants. And here's the good news, is that it's not your job to take down the giants. He's going to do it as we lay our lives down to the king and worship him and serve him and obey him. The king will rise up in you and you will have to do nothing but proclaim the name of Jesus. This is why David, right? David is in front of the hugest giant. He's a little squirt. And he says, you come here with spears. You come here with armor. But I come here in the name of Jesus, my Lord. And in that proclamation, one swing and the giant is dead. In the name of Jesus, because in every, the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. That there's a power in the name of Jesus in my own life. And the wrestling of we have today is just saying, will you believe with me? Will you take down and say, God, I can't take down my unbelief. I pray every day, God, take down my unbelief. Do you know that I do that? Every day I'm in my room, I'm saying, God, purify my heart. Make me love like you. I used to pray, give me the cute husband. <laughs> like, give me the great marriage. Give me success. Now I'm saying, make me love like you. Let me look like you, God. Take the jealousy. I was just talking to my roommate last week about comparison. And I was just, I'm just so honest because I'm so, I'm tired. And I got nothing to hide because he's won victory. Why do I have to be afraid? Amen. Right? So I can tell you my weakness because in my weakness, he's my strength. Yeah. And I can boast of my weakness because the power of Christ resides in me. And though I'm weak, he is strong. And there's a freedom as we walk in that. We don't have to be afraid. Christians, we're so afraid. It's because we don't know that we know that, that behind the giants, behind the vision, is a God who will never leave you. Who will never leave you. It's not an I, it's a we. And when my sister died a number of years ago, I remember laying in my bed at night. I'm not saying it's all roses. I'm not giving you the cheap gospel. But I'm saying he will meet you in the valleys. He will will kiss you with his kisses. He will touch your wounds with his wounds. And there will be a resurrection. If you don't give up, you win. That's my message. Church, if you don't give up, you win. If you keep walking in him and laying your life down. And I'm going to ask some hard questions today because I think this is the day that God is going to reign. And there's going to be some stakes to the ground to say, no more giants here, God. I lay my heart to you and I give you permission to take this down. Because sometimes we like cuddling with our woundedness. 
We like playing and licking with our past. We like nuzzling up to my demons because they're comfortable. I'm just saying they're familiar. I've always been insecure. This is who I am. I've always been addicted. That's just how it works. I've always had this anger issue. It's just in my family line. I've always been this. I've always had this. This is part of my Enneagram. I'm a four. I'm a five. I'm an eight. I'm whatever it is. But I'm telling you none of those names. I am the name of Jesus Christ who lives in me. And my woundedness and my brokenness and my parents' divorce and my addiction and my hurt past or my smallness and my small little, I'm a small personality. I'm not just like those people. Whatever your story is, there's a greater story that God wants to resurrect. And it doesn't have to look like anybody else. There's a territory in your heart just for him, just for him. And he's asking you, will you, will you turn your ways? And I'm going to talk today in a short amount of time just about four ways because scripture is really cool about what, what does that look like to repent? What does that look like to turn our hearts to him? In a, in a hungry world that needs your face. Like, I need you. The Lord needs you in this mission field. And if you're like me, I feel inadequate. I had someone pick me up from the airport yesterday. And he was asking me all these questions about ministry. I'm a little bit sick, so excuse my voice. He's like asking me all these questions. Like, what do I do? How do I? And I was just like, I have no idea. <laughs> I literally was like, the Lord is telling me to unlearn everything I know, to lay my life down. And I'm like just quoting scripture to him because I feel like he's teaching me that this is him and him alone. No more strategies or posturing or control or figuring out. I just, everything is, could you, he needs a people radically surrendered because in this season, he's doing a new thing. This season in the church, he's doing a new thing. It's not going to look like what it was before. I know that's weird because we're all in college, but there's something happening in a spiritual level. There's even the things that are happening politically. There's a battle happening right now in the spiritual realm, and he's waiting. In Romans, it says, I'm aching and waiting for my children, right, to rise up. He's talking about for, for birth, birthing pains that right now for the children to know who they are because there's a battle that we have in this world, and it begins with our own heart. And so the first, we're going to talk about four quick points. What is repentance? There's one scripture verse as I go in today, and I'm going to do this relatively quickly. If my people, this is in Second Chronicles, I, this is a scripture verse that if those of you who have been following anyone prophetic, prophetic is a big word that just means people that hear from God, which is us. <laughs> we're all prophetic. We're all called to be prophetic. And this is a scripture verse that was much used in the last years with the United States repenting, with all the things happening politically. And I really feel like the Holy Spirit is on this scripture verse. It's a call for us to repent and turn. And everything that's going on, it's like he's shaking us to get our attention. And it says this, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. The land in your heart where it has the giants, if we turn to him and say, I can't do it, if I walk these steps, I'm going to talk about that really quickly. Number one, um, I love that it starts off with saying we need to um, humble ourselves. This is an image of, of um, Bartimaeus, um, <clears throat> which I love because in, if you know, I wish I had more time. I don't. But if you, well, if you broke open Mark's gospel, um, Mark in Mark's gospel, the, the disciples are really stupid. Like He uses like a really rough Greek. And so throughout Mark's gospel, you'll have a lot of, all the gospels are different, and I get geeked out with all this stuff because I love the word. But in Mark's gospel, it's very old Greek, and he oftentimes has the, the, the disciples more than any other of the scriptures look very foolish, like they're blind, they don't understand, he's rebuking them, all these things are happening. And it's oftentimes the people that are humble, the people that are lowly, that see. And the Bartimaeus story is right after this part where, um, in, this, in the scriptures, where it's actually like a key scripture where it's all the disciples are with him, but he's the one that's blind that says, King of David. He's the one that sees. And even though we can be the Christians, sometimes that we're the ones that actually are the ones that are blind. We can think that we have it all together. And I say that because, like, there's moments where I walk as a national speaker. I don't mean that as, like, but there can be names that I'm like, I, don't, I have friends. I do this for Jesus. Look at me. And God, and God humbles me to my knees and shows me my smallness, that it's, it's the meek. It's the lowly that he'll remember. The Pharisees are the ones that he rebukes. And sometimes, I, and I say this with all humility, I can feel really good about myself because I'm not kicking cats, you know, like even though I really don't like cats at times. Like I'm not doing mean things, but I can give myself the, like this idea that I have it all together. And I remember this day that I, um, I came back from ministry and 
Um, it's like after you do amazing things for the Lord, you're like, I'm amazing. And God did all these amazing things. And thank you, Jesus. And you're feeling so great. And I remember I used to sell drugs for a living. Legally, legally, um, I was a... <laughs> Legally, I was a pharmaceutical sales rep for a number of years while I did <laughs> legally, and now I just sell Jesus. I sell the real crack. Um, sorry, I'm not that soon. Erase that. Um, and so anyway, I, uh, I come back, and so I don't know if you've ever had those worst days ever. I come back from this job, and so we used to have these things on pharmaceutical sales where you bring in what they call thought leaders. You bring in a thought leader across the country who would train the other doctors about a medication that you want to promote and teach them how to use it. So I had this big day. It was like the big like finals day. I had preparing for, for weeks to get this big guy, this you know, well-known doctor to come in. I'm wearing my suit. I'm doing all the professional things, and everything that day went wrong. Right? Like, I got up late. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you're prepared for the game, and you just you strike out. So I got up late. My hair was disheveled. Dry shampoo. Couldn't even fix it, ladies. It was wrong. <laughs> it was bad. I drive off. I have to pick up breakfast. And the, I, I, was, I was late to picking up breakfast. The guy behind the counter, I think, was, like, on drugs. Like, I, I just was like, this is ridiculous. I was angry. And the cop almost pulled me over. And in this moment, you ever have this moment? You're like, Duh. I get a phone call that day from someone in ministry that's like, Mary, Mary Bielski, I have heard your prophetic voice, right? Like I have heard, and as they're like telling me the goodness of who I am, I'm seeing myself like strangle the 15 year old kid and like flick, I'm, I didn't yell at the cop, but like all my rage of that day, like God in my humility is like showing me like, oh yeah, really? And that day I went to my room, true story, I went to my room and I, I fell to my knees and said, oh, God, I cannot do this without you. And I want to begin today, if you see the obstacles and the giants in your life as bigger than yourself, amen. Because God never asked you to fight the battle alone. He said, fear not, I will never forsake you, I will never leave you. You're not fighting the battle. You're yielding yourself to the king who's already won it. And I laid my life in that, and I lay it down every day, right, to humble yourself. To say, God, I need you in my life. I need you in this, this, this whatever relationship it is, and on and on. So humbling ourselves laying ourselves and praying to the Lord, I want to ask if you're here today and you're wanting to give your life more to Jesus, all it takes is every day in your secret place to yield yourself and see God show up. Next slide, we're going to keep going through this. Number two, he said to seek his faith. If you, if you pray, right, and what are we doing when we pray? We're seeking his face. Now, some of us don't know that terminology. Um, we see this a lot. David uses this in Psalms 27 where he says that he will seek the face of the Lord. To seek his face, oftentimes we'll say, and not his hands. What do I mean by that? What do you mean when you say you're seeking someone's face? Have you seen a lineup for someone who's in like a law case, a criminal, where they blot out their face? Because the face reveals the identity. The face reveals the person of who they are. I can show you my arm, right? And you can't tell me who I am. I can show you my face. And you see the face in the eyes of a God who lives. It's the revelation of who Jesus is. It's the person and not the hands. He doesn't say... Show me your hands so I can feed you. He's going to feed you. He says, seek my heart. Seek to know me. Seek a relationship. Seek a face, not my hand. Not what you're going to do for Jesus. For many years, I asked God to do this for do this. Now I ask God, may I become more like you? May I yield? May I love you? And we need a church. I want to just, I want to cry out. This year, he's been loving me. My, you guys, he's changing my life. I want you to know he's real and he's loving me in my own places and he's setting me free. I'm in my room right now in this season, this sweet season. He's so sweet. As I'm crying with my friends, just see how he loves me and my littleness and all the ways that you struggle with being loved. If you just would put your eyes on him, because what the enemy does is he, we look at our circumstances and we look at our brokenness and we look at the TV and the fake news when there's a, a good news that's coming and rising up. And all I'm saying is there's not, some of us are like, what do I need to do? It's just a little turn. Look up. I had, a, I had a spiritual director once, and I was struggling with receiving love. You ever have those moments? Yeah. You're like really hard to, when you're in your stuff, and you're like, oh. And I was like, it's hard for people to love you, and I just can't look up. And she's like, it's going to be scarier if you keep your eyes down, right? There's, there's a call to not just keep, to look up at the eyes that are already looking at you. Yeah. And some of us have not looked at him. You know, the rich young man slides into Jesus. I love this line because over and over, there's like these little moments Rich young man thinks he has it all together. He slides in, what do I need to do for eternal life, you know? And Jesus lifts off all the commandments, and he's like, yes, I did that, right? And then he picks the one thing, the one part of his heart, of the land, right? Because he's yielded himself in all the other parts. But there's one part of his land and his heart, of his money, that he hasn't yielded. Because Jesus wants it all. And many of us give 90% of our heart. 
We give the majority of our heart in this area, and then there's one area that we're like, not that one. That's fine. And so the rich young man slides in. He's righteous. He's holy. He's living a good life, and there's one part that Jesus says, I want that because you're not all mine. And until I own your house, many people rent their homes to Jesus where he wants us, to, he wants to own it. Because if he owns it, if we become his possession, he can do what he wants. If we become fully yielded, then we're free. But right now we're just renting this spot or this part. We're kind of, you know, bargaining with the Lord. And there's this moment. But the cool part, this is why I love the rich young man. I love that story because I think about it all the time. There's a moment where the rich young man runs in. He's like, what do I need to do? Yes, crap. That's a lot. What if I have to give up? you know, having sex with my boyfriend? What if I have to give up the way I act at parties? What if I have to give up drinking? What if, I, what if I have to give up the way I talk about my boss when I get really angry? What if I have to get rid of my unbelief with, my, with God or even my parents who I'm really angry at and I haven't? Like, that's too much. I can give you this much, but I can't give you that. And we have a whole church, right? And, and I, I want to I say is that the, the, that, the that is what he's looking for. And I love that the rich young man, he walks away sad. Jesus says, I want it all. I want your whole heart. You've given me most of it, but I want that. And he, he walks away sad. It's too much. It's too much to lay my life down there. But there's a moment in this scripture where the, Jesus says, but he looks at him with love. But that he looks at that in the midst of all of us, when we, like in my own stuff, where I can't give him that little part He's still loving us. That that face, that face, like have you beheld the face of the Lord? Because what we behold, we will become. What we behold, you have to hear me. What you behold, what you see, what you seek, you will become. If you behold finances, um, success, that is what you'll be driven to. If you seek the kingdom of God, right, and his righteousness, all that I have will be given to you. If you seek my face, if you seek my heart, if you seek to love me, if you're in your room worshiping in college and saying and seeking the truth and falling in your face and saying, I failed again, but I'm with you and I love you. If you seek him, if you seek him, right, that's where the victory comes. All that I have is given to you but you have to seek me and we have a church right now that's kind of seeking him when it's okay but to say God and here's the thing you don't have to do anything but God I want you in my life move in me I want to see this I want to have his eye have you ever seen what it looks like to have the lover of the universe look at you like when my sister died I remember laying in the bed at night and I would think to myself like Jesus would you just hold me do you know what it feels like to be John um, the disciple, the beloved, and just having your head on his chest. Do you know what that feels like? See, in that place, nothing can touch you. This is why P Paul is in a prison cell, and his circumstances look horrible, and he's singing psalms. He's singing psalms in the dungeon. They're singing hymns because his head is on his heart and his eyes are on his face. And when you behold him, you have all things because the lover is looking at you and he's, you're his beloved and my beloved is mine. And I don't care about the dirt because I love you and you love me. And we're living in this dance of new life. And when we become those people that regardless of our circumstances, we know who we are because the king lives in me and you can't touch me in him. People will start turning to the light that will live in us. We will become a people of light in the darkness to look at his face right? And turn. So as we end, the, the third part, there's, there's two more as we go. I want to ask you today, the third part, right? If I seek his face and turn from your ways, is that there's a decision at one point in your life. When I was 19 years old, we were talking about my conversion. I went to confession. I hadn't been to confession in a long time. And um, the priest asked me, how old are you? And I'm like, I'm 19. Don't ask me questions. And um, <laughs> that's weird. And I remember he gave me a whole rosary as my penance. And I didn't even know how to pray the rosary. And I was mad. I was like, I didn't kill somebody. Why are you giving me a whole rosary, right? Like, and I was so upset. And, but it was the simplest question. Like, he said, you need to, in this, in this confession, he said, you need to start making decisions in your life. Like, you need to choose. And some of us in this place, maybe you're radically in love with Jesus. And you've said, I've given it all. I, I think there's more. There's always more surrender. And for those of you who are here that are like, these people are Jesus freaks, and I kind of got, you know, tied into this place, and I don't know, like, just a little bit of a turn, I want to encourage you that if you turn, you'll find a face that's already looking at you. 
a face that's already loving you and beholding you and standing in you and speaking truth to you and building you up and strengthening you and will feed you and will and will and all your desires. I'm not saying it's the gospel of 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 um, you know like all the greatest things are going to happen. I'm saying that there's a God that's going to be with you, so nothing else matters. Because when you have Him, you have everything. He's the gift. He's the all in all. He's the, the He's the end of all things. That's the Holy Spirit abiding in us. But there comes a point where we need to choose. And at a moment the other day, I had a, um, I got into an angry fight with a friend, and, and I was really angry. I like to share my sins on stage because it's just, yeah, you go. Just, I'm just, that's what I do. They're like, what do you do? I'm like, I just share my brokenness and give glory to the king, <laughs> right? Right? Because then, because then we don't have to like posture ourselves. Let's just be real. We all go. We all have territory that isn't his, and so let's just put our territory out and say it's yours now, God. Let's do it together. Let's stop hiding behind our faces. You know what I'm saying? So in this moment, I was like really, I was angry at this relationship. And, and God just said in a simple way, like, do you choose, do, do you want to love or do you want to be right? Like, will you choose? Like, there's these moments in our lives where he just says, will you choose me? Will you give your fiat like Our Lady? Will you lay your life at my feet? And many of us in this room, there's just, I just feel like there's a deeper place in the church right now of surrendering and abiding. We're going to have the band come up in a second. Um, And I'm going to pray with you for the Holy Spirit to come and illuminate your own hearts. Illuminate your own fears of intimacy, your fears of relationships, your fears of the future, your fears of yourself, your past, all the things, Lord, I ask that you would come. There's a, you know, I've done a lot of inner healing work in my life, and um, I love the story of the doubting Thomas. There's an image I want you to look at before we go into prayer. It's a simple image because Jesus already did the glory. Jesus already did, um, he already rose, and doubting Thomas doesn't believe. I love that story because as I stand up here today, I really, as I prayed, I felt like there's some of you that still aren't sure and aren't ready, and I want to give you permission to be where you're at because I believe that the God of the universe is going to come here today in the flesh. And what I love about this story is he doesn't yell at Thomas because of his unbelief. He touches his wounds. Notice in that picture how gentle Thomas, he, or Jesus says, just see my wounds. I want you just to touch this place. And he pulls, he, look at his hand. He's like gently pulling his hand in to Jesus' wounds, saying that everything in your doubt I've already died for for you. Everything in your life, in your, in your territory of your land. I've already suffered and died and given my life so that I could love you in that land. And I'm not afraid of your woundedness, Thomas. I'm not afraid of your unbelief. I'm not afraid of the, the lies that you carry and I'm not even rebuking you because I'm for you. I want you to hear this. God is for you. He says, I have written your hands in my palms. But he sings over you at night. And he fights your battles sometimes when we don't see him. And he's not afraid of our messiness. He's not afraid of our insecurity. He just says, go deeper into those places. And you'll find me there who's already bore that suffering with you if you just lift and seek me. I remember when I was doing inner healing work, I went on this trip, and I was ready to, and this is what I think the answer of seeking his face. I was on this trip ready to do inner healing work. I've done a lot of work on my own heart, and I went there like as a drill sergeant for God to do incredible things. I got off the plane, and I remember this priest. He's like, what do you want to do? I'm like, well, let's fix me, right? Let's fix my territory. Let's just get this done. And he started talking to me, and he's like, well, we can do that. And here's the thing, we're going to have adoration in a minute. And Jesus can come in here and you can just list out your sins and say, I'm going to seek you. So I was like, okay, let's just talk about my woundedness, what happened in fifth grade. Let's just do all the work, get rid of all the awkwardness in me, my neediness, my insecurity, my anger issues, whatever's in your heart. You know, I'm like, yeah, let's, let's make it painful and let's get it done. Because I'm like, you know, like, and he said, or, I'm like, or, there is no or. Like, Jesus fixed this. And he sat there in the car, I'll never forget, he said, or you can, you can have a little romantic love story with him this week. You can write poetry with him and you can gaze in his eyes. And you can hear his voice singing over you and you can let down all of his walls and you can let him love you. 
He started talking about the love story. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Don't you see? It's the kindness of God that in the midst of everyone laying there, he's so kind to me. I'm insecure and I don't have it all together and I'm crying with my friends in the other place. I really love him, y'all. I love him with all my heart and I do it imperfectly and he still loves me. I mess up and he still loves me. And he comes after me day after day. And sometimes in the mornings he sings little songs to me. Like that song Nora Jones right now, he keeps singing to me like, come away with me in the night. He, every morning he's been singing it to me. He wants to sing you a new song. A song. Your old song is not here in this season anymore. It's time to let go of the old song. There's a new song of heaven. There's a new song that's moving in this season in the church. And we have to attune our faces to the king for him to sing it to us. You don't have to find your song. It's already woven in who you are. You just have to yield to a God who's singing it to you today. And if we as a people right now would just come to him, seek his face, turn our ways to his eyes, to a God who's loving us, we'll meet a God whose goodness and his kindness is with us all the time. And it's in that that we fall to our faces and sing glory. So Holy Spirit, as we end today, I ask as we begin, as we prepare our hearts, I'm going to have um, Brad come up, but I just want you to close your eyes and I just want you to ask, Holy Spirit, to ask as we move today that we would see your face, that there would be a song for us today, a new song over our past, the stories and the lies that we've believed, our insecurity, God, it's time that we believe who we are. And I ask as we begin right now that you would just I just want to take a moment as we behold him. And I want us to actually sing. If this is going to be kind of strange, I feel like the Lord's saying, um, I think there's a song, I, there's a quote that says, um, our friends are those who sing the songs of our heart back to us when we forget the words. And in scripture it says, I no longer call you slave, but I call you friend. And I feel like the Lord wants to sing you his song. And I want you to listen for a minute for your song. That Lord, I ask Holy Spirit as we sing. We're just going to have a little bit of music playing as we prepare. Just Holy Spirit, as we sing right now, would you start singing to them a song? For some of us, it might be victory. For some of us, it might be surrender. But God, would you start right now as we move? What is the song that you sing over them as they look at your face? What's the song that you want to remind them of your goodness as we repent and turn to you? What do you want to tell us in this season? Is there some point, is he pointing at something in your heart? Right now, I'm just going to be quiet for a second and just let God speak to you. Jesus, what are you asking of me right now? I feel like he's just like, look at me. Let me love you. Let me see your face. Let me kiss your cheek. Let me tell you that I'm with you. I've just prophesied over you tonight that I will never forsake you. I will never forsake you. Though a mother will forsake their child, though a mother might turn from their child, I will never forsake you, it says in Isaiah. I will never turn my face from you. I am for you. I am not against you. I am your father. And even though your father has forsaken you or your parents have hurt you, I am a God that will stand in in the gap for you. Would you turn to my face? I love you. I just feel his love for you, God. God, would you pour a love, a new song over us as your children? to remember your goodness. Would you remind us tonight of your goodness that in the midst of all of our struggles, you're still holding us, God. You've never lost. You've never left us. Come, Holy Spirit, as we sing this song. Just come. Come, Lord Jesus. If you, yeah, and if you just feel in your own heart, I feel like there's some people that are already singing. If there's a song that God's putting or even a prophetic word that you feel like he's putting, just, you can just sing it back to him right now. It might be his name. And I don't want this to be loud. I want this to be tender and intimate. So I want this to be about you and intimacy with him. What do you need to say to him today? Where do you need him to look? Come, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you start touching everyone's heart? feel like there's some people that he's pointing to something that you're avoiding there's a territory in your heart where you don't want to look at and I feel like he's just gently saying we can talk about this tonight 
I'm not afraid of this wound. I'm not afraid of this wound. I'm not afraid of this with you. Come, Lord Jesus. So I'm just going to sit and I'm going to behold him beholding me. I'm going to pass the mic on to my friends. The Holy Spirit, I just ask today that you would woo us back. Just give our whole hearts to you as we sing this song. Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus.